Keith Jesperson looks like an ordinary guy, but he has an extraordinary secret. As a long haul truck driver, he spends his days crisscrossing the country, all the while hiding a dark secret that will eventually earn him the chilling nickname, the Happy Face Killer. For five long years, Keith Jesperson carves a trail of terror across America, but what drives this man to commit such heinous acts of violence? It's January 21st, 1990. A pretty 23-year-old girl named Tanya Bennett is found in a ditch near the Columbia River Gorge in Oregon. She's been violated and beaten beyond recognition. A rope is tightly tied around her neck. For one woman, Tanya's body means one thing, escape. 57-year-old Laverne Pavlinak had a problem. Her boyfriend, John Sovznoski, wouldn't stop hitting her. They'd been together for 10 long years and Laverne couldn't seem to shake him. Then Tanya's body turned up and the police had no leads. Laverne decided to help them catch a killer. She placed a call to two of the Oregon detectives on Tanya's case to say she had sensitive information that could help them close it. A woman's purse was left in the trunk of her car, she claimed. Inside was a torn piece of someone's jeans. She told them how her boyfriend, John Sosnovsky, had been abusing her for years. And to really hammer the point home, she told them she'd overheard John bragging about Tanya's murder. The detectives were skeptical, and the purse in the jeans didn't match their victims. But then again, why would Laverne know the details unless she really did know the killer? They say, use what you know, and Laverne knew true crime. TV murder mysteries, movies, books, you name it, she consumed it. Other women may have used all those whodunits to plot John's perfect murder, except Laverne wasn't the type. But the cops needed a killer, and she needed John gone for good. Laverne consumed everything she could about Tanya's murder. She read the newspapers, watched the interviews, and pieced together a bulletproof story. When detectives seemed skeptical, she leaned in. John forced her to help while he violated and murdered Tanya. He threatened to hurt her kids if she didn't go along with it. Laverne explained everything in great detail. She even knew how the rope was tied around Tanya's neck. She said she was there. She helped John hide the body and cover up the crime. She just couldn't live with the guilt any longer. The detectives were between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, they had a woman openly confessing to the murder. On the other, it was too easy, too good to be true. They brought Laverne out to where they found Tanya's body. She knew almost every detail about the scene, but she couldn't lead detectives to the spot where some of Tanya's belongings were found. But how big a deal was that? The case felt open and shut. Why press it any further? John Sovznoski swore he was innocent after they arrested him, but when the death penalty got brought up, he took a deal life in prison in exchange for a guilty plea. Laverne got more than she bargained for. When they started talking jail time, she backtracked fast, tried to say it was all a frame-up job, a desperate story from a desperate woman, but nobody believed her. I made it all up to escape my abusive boyfriend. Hmm, a likely story. A jury sentenced her to 10 years behind bars. The real killer couldn't believe his luck he was untouchable. A gleeful confession appeared on the wall of a truck stop bathroom in Montana. I killed Tanya Bennett, January 21st, 1990 in Portland, Oregon. I beat her to death, raped her, and loved it. Yes, I'm sick, but I enjoy myself too. People took the blame, and I'm free. Signed with a happy face. His name was Keith Hunter Jesperson. Keith was born in Chilliwack, British Columbia, a Canadian town just that side of the border. Like most madmen, Keith grew up with abuse. He was the middle of five children. He always felt like the black sheep of the family. And Keith's father was a violent drunk. His grandfather was even worse. At six, Keith got his first taste for blood, torturing and killing gophers. By 12, he graduated to bigger prey. Stray cats and dogs started disappearing around the Jesperson family's new home, a trailer park in the little town of Salem, Washington, on the other side of the Canadian border. By this time, Keith was a big kid, big enough to earn the nickname Igor. He chased these larger animals down and strangled them with his bare hands. Sometimes he'd beat them to death with a shovel. Other times he pumped them full of pellets from his BB gun. Just like with the gophers, Keith enjoyed every minute of it. His father also approved. He bragged to the neighbors how Keith was ridding the park of vermin. 
Soon, Keith wondered what it might be like to kill people. He had a friend named Martin that was always getting him in trouble. One day, he pounced on Martin and began beating him. Keith's father pulled him off before he killed the boy. About a year later, Keith tried to drown another boy in a public swimming pool. This time, the lifeguard jumped in and stopped him. But despite his violent outbursts, Keith seemed like anyone else, except for his size. He weighed in at 255 pounds, standing almost 6 foot 8 inches tall. Now for reference, the average NFL linebacker is 6'2 and weighs about 240 pounds. At 20, Keith married Rose and the couple had two daughters and a son. Years later, one daughter would talk about the time she found some stray kittens. When her father saw them, he hung them by their tails on a clothesline before killing them. She didn't bring animals home after that. Fortunately, Dad wasn't around much. To support his family, Keith took a job as a long-haul truck driver with a company in Cheney, right outside of Spokane, Washington. But what he really wanted to do was join the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And he got his chance after the marriage fell apart in the late 80s. One day, while Keith was on the road, Rose took the kids and left. She was tired of fielding phone calls from the random women he was hooking up with on the road. Newly single, Keith could finally pursue his dream of joining the Mounties. Unfortunately, an injury during a rope climbing exercise cut that dream short. Unable to recover, Keith was dismissed from the RCMP program. He felt betrayed, angry at the world. It had been a while since he'd killed anything for fun, but that demon was still there. It was a Tuesday night in January 1990. Tanya Bennett drove out to the BNI Tavern in Portland. It was one of her favorite spots and somewhere she felt comfortable. She never noticed Keith's hulkish frame eyeing her from across the bar. Tanya posted by the pool tables and watched the sharks do their thing. She switched between beer and wine coolers and soon became visibly drunk. That was Keith's cue to approach. She took him up on his offer of a drink. Her death clock started ticking. Tanya's friends and family described her as a little slow. It made her trusting and easy to befriend. Keith was charming. He smiled. She didn't see anything wrong with him. Keith asked if he could buy her dinner and she said yes. Now this time there was a catch. Keith didn't have much cash on him. They'd have to swing by his place to grab more money. He didn't live far from the tavern. They'd be in and out. When they arrived, Keith and Tanya started talking, and she reminded him of his ex-wife and something snapped. Keith began insulting and taunting Tanya. The insults turned to arguments, the arguments turned to fists, and worse. Tanya tried fighting back, but there was no way she would ever win. Keith beat her viciously around the face and head, then he sexually assaulted her. Finally, Keith tied a rope around Tanya's neck and watched the life drain from her body. Her half-naked corpse slid to the floor. Keith never panicked. Instead, he drove back to the tavern and got himself another drink, made sure he talked loud and laughed louder so everyone knew he was there. He figured he knew how to kill someone and get away clean, but you just never know. Better to have an alibi and not need one, right? Once satisfied, he returned home and loaded Tanya's body into his car. He drove past the city limits all the way to the Columbia River Gorge. He pulled over and waited until he couldn't hear another car. When he was satisfied he was alone, Keith dragged Tanya's body from the back seat and threw her over the embankment. On his way back, he tossed the contents of Tanya's purse into a bush by the Sandy River. Then he hit a coffee shop to build up his alibi. A guy riding his his bike noticed her body several days later. It hit the papers and got Laverne's attention. She and her abusive boyfriend went down for the crime, leaving the happy face killer free to kill again. Keith's trucker job gave him the perfect cover story. He could freely drive around the country, kill as he pleased, and be gone the next day. He targeted sex workers and single travelers mostly. People the police would have a hard time tracking down. It'd take days or weeks for their loved ones to report them missing. By then, Keith was long gone. After Tanya, he kept it together for about 18 months. Now, sometime between July and August 1992, he killed a woman he knew as Claudia near Blythe, California. Police found her decomposing body on August 30th. She'd been dead for weeks and they couldn't identify her. A month later, they found the body of 32-year-old Cynthia Rose along Highway 99 near Turlock, California. At first, they called it a drug overdose. The truth wouldn't come out until later. Keith's next victim was 26-year-old Lori Pentland. Police found her body in November 1992 dumped behind a G.I. Joe store in Salem, Oregon. They could tell she'd been strangled to death. 
Happy Face's preferred method of killing. Victim number five popped up in July near Santa Nella, California. Police couldn't identify the body, so they listed Jane Doe as a drug overdose. She was known as Blue Pacheco for 29 years, named after the clothes she was wearing. In April 2022, genetic genealogy identified her as Patricia Skipple of Colton, Oregon. Maybe he was scaring himself and he wanted to get caught, or maybe he just wanted the credit. Whatever his reasons were, Keith wrote a six-page letter about his love for murder to the Oregonian in 1994. In it, he gave details about his victims and described the Bennett murder in great detail, things only the killer could know. He also wrote this, Tanya was my first and I thought I would not do it again, but I was wrong. While driving, I learned a lot and heard of people that have gotten away with such a crime because of our nomad way of life. Like his bathroom wall confession, Keith signed the letter with a smiley face. It prompted Phil Stanford, the journalist working on the story, to dub him the happy face killer. Victim number six, another Jane Doe, was found outside Crestview, Florida. A highway road crew was working along the Florida panhandle when they discovered the body. She'd been dead for over a year. Her remains were mostly bone, but a cord was still wrapped around her neck. He later told police he thought her name was Suzanne. More happy face letters came into the Oregonian. The killer took credit for Cynthia Rose. He said she was a sex worker he'd gotten rid of. In January 1995, Keith picked up 21-year-old Angela Subrise outside Spokane, Washington. She said she needed a ride to Fort Collins, Colorado to see her dad. Keith agreed and they hit the road. Along the way, Keith pulled into a truck stop so Angela could call her father. As the story goes, Angela's father told her not to come. He wanted nothing to do with her. A heartbroken Angela asked Keith to drive her to Indiana instead. She had friends there she could stay with. They pulled into another truck stop east of Cheyenne, Wyoming to rest for the night. And Keith wanted to sleep, but Angela wanted to keep going. So, Keith pressed his monster fist into Angela's throat until she stopped breathing. Then, he fell asleep. He woke up three hours later and drove to a more secluded rest area in Nebraska. There, he bound Angela's body with black nylon rope and tied her face down under his truck. He dragged the body along the hot highway for 10 or 11 miles before she came loose. Keith tossed Angela's body off the side of Interstate 80. No chance anyone would be able to ID her now. They were about 250 miles east of the truck stop where she died. Keith's eighth and final victim is the one who took him down. He'd been dating a 41-year-old woman named Julie Winningham during the winter of 1995. Her friends and family knew who Keith was, so when Julie turned up dead, everyone pointed the finger at her giant boyfriend. Detectives tracked Keith to New Mexico with a little help from his trucking company. They questioned him about Julie's murder, but didn't have enough evidence to make an arrest. And Keith continued on his route to Arizona, but he couldn't shake the paranoia. It was already over in Keith's mind. The cops were coming back. He was going to jail. He tried to kill himself twice in March. Both times he took enough sleeping pills to kill an average man. Instead, Keith just woke up well rested. On March 24, 1995, Keith wrote a letter to his brother. In it, he wrote, I am sorry that I turned out this way. I have been a killer for five years and have killed eight people, assaulted more. Keith turned himself in after dropping the letters in the mailbox. His letters and Keith's confessions helped police departments around the country solve several happy face killer cases. Keith's information led police to Angela's body in September 1995. Her skin was mostly decayed. They could only identify her by a Tweety Bird tattoo on her ankle. Back in Oregon, detectives were busy comparing the happy face letters to the paper with the letters Keith sent to his brother. The handwriting matched. Keith also revealed details that only the killer would know. For example, he wrote how one of the California victims was bound with duct tape around her hands and feet. The police never made that fact public. In another letter, Keith said he wanted to be caught and thrown in jail. He mentioned replacing that man in the Oregon State Penitentiary. That man was obviously John Sosnowski. He finished that letter by saying, most people will say I am a monster. I am not a monster. Just like the movie Jurassic Park, I was created by people. The dinosaur comparison was up for debate. Still, Keith had a point about John and Laverne. They'd been in jail since 1990 for a crime they didn't commit. Those who convicted them were positive they had the right people. They weren't about to listen to Keith. He had to prove he killed Tanya Bennett. So Keith led the police to the bush by the Sandy River. 
There, they found Tanya's purse, ID, and other personal stuff. At Tanya's gravesite, Keith gave details that, again, only the killer would know. Keith liked toying with the media. He wrote more letters from prison claiming he'd killed 160 people across the United States. At one point, he even tried to take credit for some of the Green River murders between the 1980s and 90s. Keith eventually pled guilty to killing Julie, Tanya and Lori. He was handed three life sentences, but his time in court wasn't done yet. Angela's case still lingered in Wyoming. Keith could still get the death penalty, but our killer wasn't ready to go out that way. Keith played games with the prosecutors in Wyoming. He kept changing his story and threatening to drag them into a long and costly murder trial. It wasn't worth playing along. They made a deal in June of 1998. Keith would plead guilty to murdering Angela if Wyoming took the death penalty off the table. Laverne and John walked out of jail in November 1995. She died of heart failure in 2007. John died in 2013. Meanwhile, Keith Jesperson is still alive and well at the Oregon State Penitentiary probably is not wearing the happiest of faces. And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.